Okie doke. So um, we'll uh, keep talking about uh, some alternatives for boxwood. Uh, we talked last week about a few. Uh, this one is uh, in the new gen. This is independence. So, um, you know, this is more like the growth that uh, uh, you would see from a velvet. Um, we have uh, both uh, twos and threes uh, available, which is great. Um, and I know the next crop is right on it. So uh, we'll be putting that next crop on, uh, you know, sometime uh, late May, early June. So we shouldn't have any issues. Uh, it should be pretty seamless going through. Um, you know, it's, it's new gen, so it's uh, boxwood blight resistant. Um, they did very well over the winter. Um, this was really the first harder winter they've seen. Um, I, I thought they did excellent. Um, we don't really do anything extra with them for the winter other than just put them in a covered hoop house. So um, they seem to do very well. I know there's uh, always concerns out there <clears throat> about how well uh, boxwood will do in northern environments. Uh, that's why we did scatter quite a few of those around. Uh, I know Dave uh, has some in the Chicago area and Mike, I think, has some up there in Michigan. So, uh, you know, we'll see, uh, we'll get, get a little bit of info back from people. A couple growers have them. So um, we'll see, we'll see how it goes through, but uh, all indications are here that uh, we're looking real good. We've got a great crop. You can see they're nice full size, uh, especially on that three gallon. That's a, that's a nice heavy three, so. Anyways, uh, keep pushing that and see what you can do. Uh, Catinus velvetini. <clears throat> um, I know that we are out of uh, Landcraft, the proven winter one. Um, this one is very close to it. Um, maybe not as dwarf, but uh, it's it, it's still dwarf. You know, when we talk dwarf with velvetini, it's probably about half the size of of kind of the old standards, the, the bigger varieties. So, uh, but it has a uh, nice compact shape. You know, it's got a lot of multiple breaks. Uh, you can see there uh, how the pot looked in the fall. Uh, and then the current photo, um, uh, Cotinus uh, take a long time to break growth. So uh, this is, it's just like a white gelia almost. It, it takes quite a while for it to uh, actually get some kind of color on it. So, um, it's not highly impactful plant for end of uh, April sales, but once we get into May and we start getting that red color, uh, that's that's when this uh, plant really starts to look like something. It's you know it's still a you know it's a, it's a smoke bush, so it's going to get those plumes on the end. Um, so uh, you know that's that's also the added benefit. The plume starts out uh, purple, so sometimes it's it's hard to distinguish the bloom from the foliage. Uh, but as that plume expands, uh, it keeps deepening that purplish color. Um, so uh, it, it really shows off. And then this is one that you can plant in a smaller garden. So uh, where people can't plant the standard cotinus, they can go with this. So, you know, I know you're going to have people asking for the proven winners, which we're temporarily out of. So make sure you talk about Velvetini as an option. All right, Ilex densa. So this is uh, a glabra type holly. Um, you can see here uh, how how great they look. That was a fall photo. Uh, we were just out there. There's no difference. No, there <laughs> I mean, they they look just like that, like they did in the fall. So the crop came through really nice. Um, talked about this before. Re re reminder that glabras and most hollies. Um, you know, they're more in, a, in the conifer evergreen type of family, use a lot of water uh, throughout the winter. So uh, it's very important uh, with uh, the glabras, the cronadas, the menservia type holly, they all need water and they need a lot of water right now. So, um, you know, that's always a point to bring up <clears throat> to people is uh, this plant does need maintenance all through the winter season. So just because it's Looks like it's dormant. That doesn't mean that it is. Uh, you can see here the fantastic size we have on here. We're full to the bottom. I still continue to see people buying them out there in the market and they don't have bottoms on them, probably because they get them cheap. Um, so you get what you pay for. Uh, with ours, you're going to get this nice full plant foliage all the way to the bottom. 
uh, and it's going to take off and it's going to be nice and healthy. So uh, keep touting uh, <clears throat> what we do. You know, we trim them quite a bit to keep that shape. Keep those bottoms full with lots of space and uh, our winter uh, activities that we do to keep that plant looking good for them. So we got a, we got a ways to go. We got 1600 of them available, but uh, keep pushing that. Obviously with this size, we want to uh, try to get these moved out this spring. <clears throat> All right, on the grow bags, um, I think uh, you know, Cheryl, scroll, you can scroll down more or scroll up actually. Scroll up. There we go. I was going to say, I thought it was a collage, but so, um, yeah, we got the, uh, scroll up a little more, please. So we got, uh, Juniper, uh, you should be able to scroll up a little more if you can. There it goes. Juniper Taylor. Um, you can see right there. Uh, then you have the skyrockets. Um, these are, we already pulled out everything we have sold. Uh, we put them into pots. So um, just to remind everybody, um, the root bag program is a fiber bag. Uh, it, we plant the plant in it, and then we put that into the ground. So what the guys just did was they went through, they pulled that fiber bag out of the ground, and then they put it into a plastic pot. They also hog ring on a tag that reminds the customer or the end, end person that's getting it. They have to remove that bag when they plant the plant. That's very important. That bag is not biodegradable. <clears throat> we keep it on there because it, it, it helps keep that root ball intact. Um, it's not going to fall apart when you cut it out, but uh, it just helps it with shipping and transport and it, it keeps the plant looking better on their lots too. But when whoever the end user is, when they get it, they pull it out of the pot, they cut the root bag off, take the root bag off and plant it. So every year we get at least one, <laughs> even with all of this, that uh, has has an issue with it. So make sure we're communicating about that. Um, I think most people get it, wholesalers and landscapers get it. It's just every once in a while we get a, a garden center that might give it a try as something new and bring a few in and get a little confused by it. So make sure that uh, you take the time to walk walk those customers through it. So but the plants look great. Um, do we have availability, Cheryl? It's on our website. We've got, okay. we have the pricey pungents tend to look, they want to scroll down. Okay. And then skyrockets, you have a hundred available. Yeah, so we got a few more skyrockets and then the, we got some pendulas. Those are those are great little specimen plants if they want to bring them in. So, it's a nice price. It gives you uh, a, a plant that has a lot of an interest. You know, especially this time of year, uh, especially for the uh, end of uh, April, beginning of May sales. It's just it kind of your eye kind of goes to it because it's unique. So, that might be something to talk about a little more. All right, uh, let's go into the Menservia type. So this is at the extreme end. So this is a hybrid Willimer. This is a dwarf. Um, it has really nice small leaves, glossy foliage, very soft foliage, even though it looks like it's a, a spiny holly. Uh, it's, it, it is not uh, very soft foliage, soft, soft to the touch, uh, compact, takes very little uh, maintenance. Uh, I, I don't even know why you would even trim it in the landscape, to be honest with you. Um, we do trim it to to keep it in shape, but it's it's not very much, and they usually only get one trim a year in the nursery. So this is a willowy introduction, uh, so, uh, but uh, it does very well in most of our zones. Um, you know, out of the Menservia, this, this is one to really consider to go a little far north because it's so short, it usually in a lot of areas gets snow cover. Um, it does have a real heavy, thick wax layer on the leaf, so that helps it get through the winters. Um, so, anyways, there's a lot of good points with it. Uh, we got 1,400 of them available. Juniper Blue Star. This should be one that everybody's familiar with. It's pretty much the old standby for something nice blue. Again, another plant that's uh, very low maintenance, um, very little trimming in the landscape. We, we do very little trimming in the nursery on it. 
Um, this is a two gallon. Uh, we do have 1500 of these. I think the threes were out. So we're out of threes, but we do have these twos. We wanted to show you these. The twos have a nice size to them. Um, so, uh, you know, just uh, make sure we're, we're pushing alternatives. And uh, I, I don't think you're going to have any issues. So make sure if somebody just says they have to have a three, talk about how, how nice the size is on these twos. Uh, Nitiformis is uh, one of the older spruce. Um, you can see there that that's been around for a long time as well. Um, just very flat grower spreader, um, very tolerant to a lot of situations, very tough. Uh, go way up north with this plant. Um, so I, I don't think there's anywhere that we ship to that you you cannot sell this in. So. Uh, we have 6,000 plus. Uh, we've talked about this one before. We still have a long way to go. Uh, that's what the crop looks like. So, um, Pierce, uh, Cheryl just wanted to show the Pierce blooms a little bit. Um, so, uh, Dorothy Wyckoff, um, which uh, tends to be my favorite for, for the color. Um, I really like its flower. Um, uh, Mountain Fire is in the middle there. Um, it's, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of pink hues in the bloom, but the mountain fire really refers to its new growth. So its new growth comes out red. Um, and then Katsura, uh, we just wanted to show you there how, how they're looking. Uh, they're looking real good as well. The, these are sold out, okay? But we just wanted to show you, there's a lot of them on order. So we wanted to show you the state of them. Had a few questions about them. This is what they look like. Did you take these yesterday? Or? Yeah. yeah, so these photos are yesterday. They hold on to their blooms a long time, but this one will not be in bloom past pretty much the, sometimes you can get them to hold till the last of April. It will not be in bloom for Mother's Day. So uh, this is a plant if somebody is, is using, they are blooming out in the landscape right now. So their blooms are pushing and opening up, so. Um, so, yeah, uh, the worst thing you can do, I had a few questions about it. Maybe it was last week we talked. The worst thing you can do is put this thing in any kind of heat. So you do want to protect it a little bit, but if you give it some protection from frost, especially wind, things like that. Um, but you don't want to let it get warm. Um, any kind of rough weather can really beat the flowers up and not make them last as long. So, uh, you know, just pass along those tricks and, and that way they can keep them as bloom as long as possible. And I would suggest keeping them kind of covered with white poly. They they are an understory plant. They do, they love shade. Um, they don't do particularly well in full sun in the ground. Uh, we do grow them in full sun in the nursery for the most part, but, you know, we're giving them a lot of extra stuff to keep them going. So um, best to store them on the lots and a little bit of shade and protected and how to keep the blooms going. Uh, DeGroote Spire, Uja. Um, you know, this one's fairly new. It's been around for a little while, but uh, uh, we really like it because uh, it's it's very uniform in its habit. You can see there uh, that plant uh, really had no trimming uh, where um, it, it's a slower grower, but it's still you know, it's still enough, right? It still gets big. It just, it's not gonna grow near the speed of Green Giant. A um, little bit slower grower than what uh, uh, Schmargard is, um, but it, uh, it it's, it's fairly aggressive in its own right. Um, I think it uh, is a great plant for uh, tight situations um, where they want a screen, you know, that needs to get tall, but might not particularly have a lot of room where they don't want the backyard or whatever eaten up. Uh, this would be a great plant for that. Um, it's got kind of twisty foliage in it, so it, it has a pretty neat look. Uh, it's it's unusual uh, in in how it uh, presents its foliage, so that's that's also a good selling factor. So don't have a lot of these available, but you know these are in sevens. We've got a, almost 170 of them, so uh, you know we got some opportunity there. Uh, Wygelia spilled wine. Um, so you can see there, uh, Cheryl got you some different photos. You got a today photo. Uh, we're just starting to get just a little tiny bit of push in there. A couple of those leaves on there from last year. That's the middle photo. 
fall photos to your right, and then, you know, just a flower close up. But, uh, you know, we got uh, quite a few of these available. Uh, this is by design. This seems to be one of those plants that uh, uh, we have really been, we really rifle through these in May and June. So we needed to make sure we had uh, several thousand of these uh, available going in the spring. Uh, we also have wine and rose, the same thing. That's kind of pretty much a staple. Um, so uh, spilled wine and wine and rose are, are the two staple plants that I pick for spring, you know, that, that I see from uh, your guys' cell history. You know, Mr. Bowling Ball Fire Chief's always there. Uh, it, it just seems like most of the landscapes, I think it's just those four. So, <laughs> so there's a lot of these that go out every year. So, But uh, great plant, uh, you know, they're, they're ready to ship. We do slightly enhance them. We don't really list it, but we do keep them covered. We like to just let them get a little bit of heat. We're not particularly heating them with heaters. We're just letting the houses stay a little warmer. And uh, that allows the plant to get a little more active. So you got some kind of color from Mother's Day. If you don't do that, it's very typical that this plant will still be dormant uh, almost to Mother's Day or just pushing out. So you will have no color for that Mother's Day weekend. So. Uh, with the way we do it, we like to push it along just a little bit, so that way you got some purple leaves in there from other things. So, but uh, that's that's where those are. So their their guys are out digging today, so we're out there going. Um, all indications are we, we should have a good dig round going through here. Um, there's still opportunity to uh, order more. Um, so looking at that availability, um, you know, the, the digging, you know, we've got some new people, but digging uh, is very short period. <laughs> it, go, it comes and goes real quick. So we start now and uh, several of the deciduous plants, uh, we won't be able to dig uh, after the 15th of April. So just in a few short weeks here, uh, the, the season will close. Uh, pretty much the total season closes by the first part of May. We just can't dig anymore. So once the plant really starts becoming active, um, starts to really have a lot of root growth, um, there are some nurseries that will try to push it, but uh, it, it's really a high risk thing to do and you have a high probability of failure. So we tend to stay away from that. So. Uh, got to move real quick. Uh, if you got somebody on the fence on B&B, they need to make the decision like today. So, um, you know, we'll take orders right up to the bitter end, but uh, just depends how spring goes. And uh, looks like this year, all indications are it's going to go right on time or maybe even a hair ahead of the schedule. So, all right. 